Throughout naval history, some vessels transcend the mere confines of steel and machinery, instead becoming symbols of innovation, military power, industrial ingenuity, and sometimes beacons of human tragedy. In some rare cases, a vessel may have a history that contains all of these traits. Among these, the Italian battleship Leonardo da Vinci stands as a little-known example of such a ship, a vessel born in response to the looming shadows of its French counterparts, designed to be a guardian of the sea, yet destined for a far darker fate. Its story, while short, has chapters filled with ambition, unforeseen challenges, tragedy, hope, and finally, apathy towards a bygone era. A warship that never saw combat, yet would become the grave of 248 brave souls. So let's unravel the mystery that surrounds this sunken giant and explore the depths of its design, the intricacies of its wartime strategy, and the dramatic effort to resurrect it from the abyss. In the early 1910s, Leonardo da Vinci emerged as the final installment of the Conte di Cavore class. Commissioned by the Royal Italian Navy and completed just before the onset of World War I, Leonardo da Vinci, named after the artist and inventor, was built by Odero Shipbuilding Company at their Sestri Ponente Genoa shipyard. She was laid down on the 18th of July 1910 and launched on the 14th of October 1911, completed on the 17th of May 1914. The ship saw no combat during the war and spent most of its time at anchor. Admiral Paolo Ravel, the Italian naval chief of staff, believed that the Austro-Hungarian submarines and mine layers could operate too effectively in the narrow waters of the Adriatic. The threat from these underwater weapons to his capital ships was too serious for him to actively deploy the fleet, instead deciding to implement a blockade at the relatively safer southern end of the Adriatic with the battle fleet, while smaller vessels such as torpedo boats conducted raids on the Austro-Hungarian ships and installations. Designed to counter the French Corbet class dreadnoughts, which caused them to be slower and more heavily armed than the first Italian dreadnought, Dante Alighieri, the ships were 168.9 meters long at the waterline and 176 meters long overall. They had a beam of 28 meters and a draft of 9.3 meters. The Conte di Cavore class of ships displaced 25,000 long tons at deep load. They had a crew of 31 officers and 969 enlisted men. They were powered by three sets of Parsons steam turbines, two sets driving the outer propeller shafts and one set the two inner shafts. Steam for the turbines was provided by 20 water tube boilers, eight of which burned oil and 12 of which burned both fuel oil and coal. Designed to reach a maximum speed of 22.5 knots from 31,000 shaft horsepower, Leonardo da Vinci only reached a speed of 21.6 knots using 32,800 shaft horsepower. The ships carried enough coal and oil to give them a range of 4,800 nautical miles. The main battery of the Conte di Cavore class consisted of 13 305mm Model 1909 guns in five centerline gun turrets with twin gun turrets super firing over a triple gun turret in four and aft pairs, with a third triple turret amidships giving them an amazing 13 main guns. This secondary armament consisted of 18 120mm guns mounted in casemates all around the sides of the hull. For defence against torpedo boats, the ships carried 14 76.2mm 3-inch guns, which could be arranged all over the ship in various configurations. They were also fitted with three submerged torpedo tubes, one on each broadside and the third in the stern. The Conte di Cavore class has a complete waterline armour belt that had a maximum thickness of 250mm amidships, which reduced to 130mm towards the stern and 80mm towards the bow. They had two armoured decks, the main deck was 24mm thick on the flat and 40mm thick on the slopes that connected to the main belt. The second deck was 30mm thick. Frontal armour on the gun turrets was 280mm thick and the sides were 240 Despite never seeing actual combat, tragedy struck on the night of August 2nd, 1916, when an internal magazine explosion in Taranto Harbour led Leonardo da Vinci to capsize in 11 metres of water. The loss was profound, claiming the lives of 248 officers and enlisted men. 
Determined not to let the tragedy rest at the bottom of the harbour, the Regia Marina embarked on an ambitious plan to salvage Leonardo da Vinci. Initial rejection of explosive demolition gave way to meticulous effort to make the ship's hull airtight and raise it using compressed air and pontoons. Over two years of preparation followed, involving the removal of coal, ammunition, gun turrets, all by divers to reduce the weight. The ship's funnels had to be cut off and a deep channel was dredged for the arduous task of refloating the inverted vessel. Finally, on September 17, 1919, Leonardo da Vinci resurfaced, her upside-down hulk brought to the surface and moved to dry dock. The following years witnessed meticulous efforts to reinforce her decks and prepare her for an eventual writing. The Regio Marina envisioned modernising Leonardo da Vinci, but financial constraints led to a different fate. On March 22, 1923, the once proud dreadnought was sold for scrap. Concluding a chapter that began with ambition, saw tragedy, and ultimately ended with the dismantling of a vessel named after a visionary artist and inventor. Leonardo da Vinci's journey from construction to salvage is a testament to the unpredictable currents of time. Welcome to the channel. Holiday time, and we're looking at Leonardo da Vinci, the Italian premium battleship, and she is fun. I like this ship. She has been just as profitable as the Marat, the Soviet Marat, and she can she can fight a Marat too. She's a little bit more squishy. She can be ammo racked, but having 13 guns really is a benefit to this ship. The front turrets are angled in such a way that you don't have to offer a full broadside to get eight guns on target. If you offer some more angle, you can get 11 guns on target. And if you give a full broadside, you can get 13 guns on target, which is, I think, fun. The shells are pretty good. You got 30 kilos of ammunition, uh, 30 kilos of TNT in the SAP round, and only just under six kilos in the AP round, but it has pretty good penetration. The one thing that it does suffer from is slight amount of dispersion, and I think that's mainly because every single turret sits at a different elevation on the ship, so they don't quite ever line up with each other, unlike the Soviet Sevastopol class, which has all turrets evenly spaced at the same elevation, so there's very little dispersion. But like I said, she's a lot of fun, and I've managed to grind out a fair amount of the Italian Blue Water line using this ship and it was not a misery. Being at 6.3 is a pretty generous battle rating. You will see battles of 5.3, which is an absolute shit show for the 5.3 ships that you face. And you are largely immune to cruiser fire. Even up to 8-inch fire will... Well, it, it will get through. You can be killed by 8-inch guns, but I am yet to suffer that fate. So all in all, she's a great premium battleship, and I am a little bit disappointed that it is not a tech tree ship. She is very unique, and unlike the other three, oh sorry, there are three Conte di Cavoros in War Thunder, and this is the most primitive one. And I would argue probably the best one, due to its battle rating, and this is one of the rare cases where I enjoy having that middle turret in the midship section. Usually that's a bit of a liability because it removes space for engines and stuff like that. But in this case, it's in such a good place that it really benefits the ship. Now I'm not saying to go and buy it, but for what it's worth, it's a decent ship and it will help you grind out the entirety of the Italian line. It does see battle cruisers and I am yet to find a way to kill a Scharnhorst in this ship. But that's the struggle that most ships have. The Kronstadt, you can ammo rack her at close range. And they make they get pretty angry at that. But yeah, let's jump in and I'll show you some of the games that we've played. Actually, before we do that, we'll have a look at the 7.0, which is the modernized version. The actual names, namesake of the class, Conte di Cavour. She is the modernized version. She has bigger guns, less of them. You're missing the amidships turrets, but you have much better or modernized secondaries and better AA. This ship probably deserves its own review video because it is very different. And it's uh, in some ways very similar to the new Soviet one. 
which only really differs in its secondary armament. Its primary armament is identical. So yeah, we'll, we'll have a look at a different video for these ships. I don't particularly like the upgraded Italian guns, and that's why I say that the Leonardo da Vinci is probably the best out of the three, despite being less armored, no AA, etc. The battle rating really helps you have fun. And grinding on cruisers is always profitable. All right, let's, so let's jump into a match. Looks like we've had our first Lily Liver. Don't let fear hold you back. Oh, I've been spotted in the wild. I better own up to it. Hello. <laughs> the last time I got spotted, I got shot to death. Yep, it's happening, but at least they're friendly about it. Yeah, that's me. I did the coastal terrorizing. I'm currently being terrorized by big boys. We did a whole lot of nothing this mission, so it's a scrub for the video. But we had a good conversation at least. I did literally nothing that mission. I still nearly earned 10,000 RP. That's a premium ship for you. Oh no, we've mounted the Kronsch... Is that a Kronstadt? Yeah. War Thunder spawned shenanigans all over again. Took my ammo rack. Take three. Let's see if this match will be a little bit more successful than the last two. see our battlecruiser friends who are littering the waterways at the moment due to the event. Nothing but up tiers. That's not to say you can't do anything in this ship in an up tier. You can certainly fight the other dreadnoughts and you can do supporting fire to the battlecruisers that are well armoured. But largely I haven't had any luck one-shotting anything in this ship. Larger than a cruiser anyway. Not yet. It's only my third game. Having the 13 gun broadside, I really like that. It helps space out the relatively long reload of 34 seconds. I don't have an expert crew and I would recommend doing so if you have this ship. I didn't quite have the silver lines to invest in that. But as soon as I have enough, I will get expert crew and I believe it'll bring the reload down to about 32 seconds, which is much, much more manageable. You could fire one of your guns every one and a bit seconds and that's a pretty good ripple fire. Solid hits here on the German heavy cruiser. So in this kind of up tier, I guess what I really want to do is remove the threat to the cruisers, take any dreadnoughts down, hit any heavy cruisers, any light cruisers, to try and keep our smaller boys alive. There's a very diverse range of ships because it's not quite a full match. So some of the AI are in destroyers got a few players here in cruisers at a 7.0 match so maybe they've gone cruisers for the scout planes though I don't know why on an encounter map or maybe they're playing in a squad and they don't have a 7.0 they could be saving it for later this guy here in the Admiral Hipper he may come back in a Shanol straight away once we finish him so I'm going to try not to get the last shots on that guy. <laughs> I'll let him revenge someone else. It's more about damage. I think this is an AI. We'll get some easy points. Farming the AI ships is great for events. Hits on the AI are just as profitable in terms of mission points as shooting a player. And in this kind of half-filled match, you're going to find a lot of ships that your battleship can just splat. So it takes about 9 seconds to get through all 13 guns. Which means we only have to wait about 25 seconds until the next gun is ready.
just looking at the design of the ship, I really enjoy the fact that the front three turrets are all facing the same way, and the midship tur turret has fairly good angle. So you don't have to go full broadside to get a decent salvo off on your enemy as you approach them. You can be quite aggressive. It feels more survivable than some of the German early dreadnoughts I've played. And it certainly feels about as survivable as one of the US battleships. We haven't died yet, but I'm not going to jinx that. I do know that a large caliber shell will be able to blow us up. The rear ammunition sits pretty high. And the four ammunition only just sits below the water. So anything that hits right on the waterline has a chance of getting through. Put some fire out on this Tashkent, another AI ship. I plan on finishing up the event using the Leonardo da Vinci. So as many points as possible. Looks like this guy's come back in a second heavy cruiser. So we'll put some fire out on him. And we're trying our best to hide from the battle cruisers. I don't want to get into a direct fight with one. We've taken down the Tashkent, not worth much in the way of RP. But like I said, it's still worth a fair amount of mission points. And when you're playing a rank 6 battleship, or sorry, a rank 5 battleship, you get a fairly high modifier, especially in RB. So a few decent games in a 6.3 battleship, and you can finish off a Day's Star in no time. Personally, I prefer the faster pace combat of coastal and low tier destroyers. But playing a battleship that performs fairly well can be a relaxing experience. Nice big hits here. Not quite as effective as the Japanese semi armor piercing round, but it still does a fair amount of damage to cruisers. And nowhere near as good as the Soviet one. Rolling through the guns. We haven't done a lot. We've taken out one AI ship, but we've done a fair amount of damage. 2,000 damage. Some more cruisers out here. And so I guess the best matches you want are the ones that aren't quite full. The AI ships will respawn a few times. And they're great for farming mission points. And you're not, you're not taking advantage of any systems by doing it. Those shots are looking pretty good. Massive hits there, but we managed to take out the Chapayev behind rather than our actual target. So a small amount of overshot there with the dispersion. But that means that we've still got some points to farm from this fellow here. Keeping in mind not to draw the attention of that battle cruiser in the background. Got a cruiser here that's floundering. The Admiral Hipper. There's actually quite a few of them. For a 7.0 match, it does that is surprising, and they are definitely players. Look at this light cruiser here, hiding behind the, the island. Spamming shells, not putting much effort into tactics. Let's see how well he responds to this large stream of large caliber shells we're going to send at him. I really like using the ripple fire mode. I feel like I get a lot more accuracy out of poor dispersion guns. And like I've said, you can sort of alleviate the long reload. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I look forward to reviewing the rest of the Italian Blue Water ships. I've made good progress through them. I haven't actually played many of them, but now they're unlocked, I'll be able to do so. Had a few requests for a few different Italian ships, so I'll do my best to get those out within the month. Unlike Coastal, there's enough time to have a drink while you play battleships. You're not using all your fingers like an octopus to try and keep your coastal boat under control. Hoping this last salvo finishes off this Brooklyn. Oh, down to 2% crew. That should finish him. We'll send our secondaries out one more time. He's firing back, but it's pretty much too late. And I found that the... The American light cruisers don't do too much damage to this ship. At least in my limited experience. You've got enough deck armor. You've got a few layers of deck armor. Yeah, the Brooklyn is down. Now we've got a Sephestopol class. Now we most definitely have the, the capability to destroy this ship. So let's give it a go. May need to use AP to do meaningful damage, but there is enough TNT to, to sort of jerk him awake. Shells are a little bit too short, but our follow up ones should fall right on the deck. If this doesn't prove to be very effective, we'll switch to AP. Is that a pretty good range for AP? Alright, shells are up, ready to fire. We're going to go a full broadside this time. Let's try and get some solid alpha damage. And switching to AP. We'll have a look around and make sure there's no danger. We've got some torpedoes coming in from our port bow. An SKR and an AI Tashkent. Solid first hits there from the secondaries, taking out that AI. More mission points for the bank. Yeah, so I'm not saying this is the best, the best battleship I've ever played. But it's certainly better than Nassau, I feel. It's the German battleship Nassau, the premium. And I feel that it's on par with Marat, although it doesn't have the damage output that she has. And therefore, you... I, don't foresee you getting as many kills unless you're very good at gunnery. Taking down the Prince Eugen. It's five kills, but a few of those are AI. So it's not a terribly effective game, but we're still coming second. Secondaries are ranged in on this Russian battlecruiser. A battleship, I should say. Let's see if armor piercing can do a better job. Within six kilometers, they've got only eight inches of belt armor, if I remember correctly. So if we can get in right on the water line, we may get some good hits on the ammo elevators, which seems to be the case. We've hit one of them solidly. Her shells have overshot. She's using armor piercing. I think she would be better off using semi armor piercing versus us just because they perform so well on that ship. Our shells are ready, so we get to fire again first. We're going to try and keep her in a damaged state to try and increase her reload times. Again with the overshoots, a little bit of damage to the stack. We've taken some compartment damage in the bow. We're going to switch targets here. Targets of opportunity. All right, we've got some high caliber shells coming in, turning in towards them slightly. Looks like they were over pens and went straight through the hull. Think that might be a Des Moines. Can't quite tell at that angle.
<laughs> Bombs have been dropped in the chat. Average, average ground enjoys. Ooh, we've been one tapped by the Kronstadt while not paying attention in the chat. Very nice shot. Fortunately, we have a backup. I don't think I will bother with Kaz, so we'll come back in the Leonardo again. No point bringing a torpedo boat on an encounter map unless you've got something very fast. Yeah, my ship exploded too. It got real explodey. Well, can I do anything against that Kronstadt? I probably could if I get really close. But the chances of getting close now with only nine minutes remaining. So we will find some squishier targets. Like, not this guy, but yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm pretty sure that was the American cruiser we were fighting as a second ago. Weren't sure of its classification at the time. Could be a Fargo. Nope, we missed. Try and make these ship shells count. Try and feed the shells into him and just find exactly what he's doing. He doesn't appear to be moving. But he is pointing bow on to us. So it's going to make gunnery a little bit hard to tell from this angle. Oh, we've hit the side of the ship. Abaft the funnels. Decent damage to the crew. I quite like the encounter maps. There's no pressure of the caps. If you're in a decent ship, you can earn a lot of points. There's a lot of targets to fight. If the players run out, you can go and kill the AI convoy. One of the better map modes, and I wish they would extend the battle time again. These maps used to be much longer. And you could really rake in the earnings, especially during events. Guns up. Only four turrets ready. The Y turret slightly off. Obstructed by the rear stack. And that's why I said you don't have to be full broadside in this ship. It's got very good fire angles for what it is. And it suits War Thunder's meta of always advancing. Some ships like the Yamashiro, who have predominantly uh, stern-facing guns, are more suited for a running engagement. Still can't, can't extract this fellow from behind the cliff. Using armor piercing due to the angle that he's sitting to me, hoping that it will pass through more of the ship, but we're not even getting hits. This is my poor accuracy coming to show. Taking out the rear turret. One of our friendly cruisers is in the <laughs> in the enemy convoy zone, so this match will be over fairly soon, unless they kill him. He's got a German cruiser in there, nice and close to the enemy convoy. I do find the dispersion to be more pronounced when you're angled, just due to the different elevation of the guns. I, I really think that's the case. Feel free to disagree, let me know in the comments. Yeah, 
that's an American heavy cruiser. And he is impossible to extract. <laughs> oh, we got a good hit that time, finally. The Y turret has now come into its fire arc, but it's a little bit out of time with the rest of the guns. Good hits there with the secondaries. There we go. Got him down, and it was a Baltimore. I'm not so good at individual identification of each model of ship from a distance. <laughs> but I know how to kill them by class. All right, here's, here's our main foe, our nemesis. I think this is the one that took us down before. I think we have enough pen here to get through something. Probably not the hull, but at least the deck. He's already taken a lot of damage to his elevators. He's probably lost his ammunition, actually. Let's have a look and see if he fires those main guns at all. Kronstadt has a very fragile ammo rack. But it doesn't kill the ship. Right, he'll be easy pickings, he's more than he tied up with the rest of my team. We're the only one coming from this side. He's got pretty fast tra turret traverse though, so he could react very quickly. Now there's a Scharnhorst attacking the enemy convoy, so we're about probably a minute or two away from being over. Yeah, so I guess if I show you this ship at its worst, you know, this is the worst possible type of game you could have, a 7.0 match. And we haven't done too badly. We died once, but being a premium ship, this the, yeah, the repair cost is pretty low. As is the crew train cro cost, but unfortunately it still costs 1.2 million silver lines to expert the ship. And if you buy it, I suggest you do that. There's a Scharnhorst here. Let's have a go at the Scharnhorst. Let's see if we can do some kind of visible damage to this impenetrable beast. <laughs> that ship is so well designed. And the armor model in this game it just serves the ship so well. Semi-armor piercing, big hits, but he's already taken damage to those decks. Oh, we managed to damage one of the, the compartments. We destroyed a compartment. That was enough TNT. Unfortunately, we won't have enough time to see out the fight, though. He's moving away from us, so we need to shoot over him. Trying one more time with semi-armor piercing. Try and spread them all along the length of the ship. Yeah, we're doing some damage. We're doing a fair amount of crew damage. Over 100 men killed, but that's the end of the battle. Not too bad, 10,000 damage, 3,000 mission points. That equates to about 7,500 after RB modifiers. And we've made 10,000 RP again, and 170,000 silver lions with a 100% booster. Finishing up the challenges for the day, make sure to subscribe. See you next time.